Right. Hello. Uh, I'm Pradnya, and today I'm going to talk about shadow rendering and performance. Uh, let's look at the agenda first. Uh, so we start very light, uh, just some drop, drop shadow basics. Uh, then we're going to move on to more complicated stuff. That's refresher on a render loop and off-screen passes. Uh, how do we avoid off-screen passes? And uh, then we will diagnose some render loop issues and see how you can use that to diagnose issues in your applications. And um, there is also a hidden agenda, so look out for that. All right, uh, so what is a, a shadow, right? A uh, shadow is an effect that gives your uh, elements an appearance of having a shadow, right? It adds some dimension and depth. As you can see, uh, it can also be very useful to highlight an element, especially if the background color is clashing uh, with uh, your element's color. And of course, um, I'm sure many of you have done this before. You just want to add it because your very friendly designer <laughs> has asked you to add it, and you're like, yeah, OK, cool. <laughs> so uh, how do you do it? Uh, pretty straightforward. You just set these four uh, properties, offset, opacity, radius, and color, and you should be all set. But um, our main topic, shadows are expensive to draw. Uh, this is because the rendering engine has to spend some extra time to draw a, a view with a shadow compared to one without it. And if you overload your rendering engine, uh, you're going to experience a frame drop. Let's try to understand what that would mean. So uh, as you may know, 60 frames per second is uh, the standard frame rate on iPhones and some iPads. Actually, it can be 120 on iPad Pros, but let's ignore that complication. Um, 60 frames per second, yes. When that happens, you have 60 frames in one second. That means that you have 16.67 milliseconds uh, when one frame lasts on the screen. And it also means that you have 16.67 milliseconds to prepare the next frame. And if you are not able to prepare your next frame in the given amount of time, you are going to see the previous frame stay on. And uh, that's how uh, you can experience a screen lag or a hitch. Uh, hitch is basically Apple's fancy way of, of uh, uh, talking about lags and uh, Apple terminology, if you know what I mean. Uh, so uh, let's try to understand what happens in the 16.67 milliseconds. And whatever happens, it's called render loop. And a render loop, basically, uh, the end goal of a render loop is to draw your display, right? And a display is built from a display buffer where every single element of a display buffer corresponds to one pixel on the screen. And once your display buffer is ready, it's going to be applied to your actual display. So we are going to try to understand how display buffer is, gonna be, gonna, is built for every single frame. So uh, a render loop, right, uh, it always starts with a requirement to update your display. This can be in response to a number of events. Uh, it could be uh, because your user tapped a button. It could be because of an asynchronous event, like you um, receiving like a network call response or a timer event even. So once you sort of receive those events, what the rendering engine does is it's going to go and find out all the layer trees that need updating. So um, these are sort of called layout requests. So all of these layout requests are uh, taken together and sent in the next uh, phase, which is the commit phase. Uh, FYI, all of these trees that need laying, laying out, uh, these are basically all the explicit and implicit views that have received calls to set needs layout method. So all of these are basically now going into commit phase. And the commit phase is going to update the, uh, the layer trees from parent to child. Um, you uh, basically, this is uh, the rendering engine's way of making everything more performant. Because if you uh, update a, a layer randomly, uh, it's not going to be performant because you don't know what the layer behind is and all of those things. So basically, it just makes sense. So all the updates are going to happen at once in the commit phase. Once commit phase is done, it's going to submit uh, the updated layer trees to the next phase, which is the render phase. Uh, in this phase, you're going to receive the submissions, which are called commits, by the way, hence the name commit phase. So these submissions are executed in order, again, from parent to child, because this makes sense. 
And um, at this point, the rendering engine knows exactly where to draw the layer, uh, how to draw the layer. All the information has been processed from the commit phase. So rendering engine is, uh, sorry, in the render phase, it's just going to go and draw all of those elements on the display buffer using a GPU context. And once the display buffer is ready, you just apply everything to the display and you can see your nice new frame. And yeah, so all of this happens every time uh, for every frame, right? And shadows particularly are drawn in the render phase. So we're going to go and look at that phase in more detail uh, with an example. So if you look at this image, a nice blue square tree and if you look closely, it also has a shadow behind it. So we are in the render phase, and we're going to go and draw the tree. So the render phase, what it's going to do is divide this into a step-by-step -step plan. Uh, and once the plan is ready, we're going to draw every single layer one by one. First step, very straightforward. We already know how to draw this rectangle. It's a CG rect size, position, everything is there. We go and draw it on the block buffer. Once that's done, next step is the shadow. And we have a problem because we don't really know how to draw the shadow uh, because a shadow shape depends on the shape of the source view. Uh, source view hasn't been drawn yet because it comes after. So the engine will first draw the source view to identify the shape on a separate buffer. So do note we've used a separate buffer here, which is called an off-screen buffer. And the act of using an off-screen buffer is called an off-screen pass. So because of the shadow, we have incurred one off-screen pass. Um, and uh, yeah, so we still need to convert it into a shadow. We're going to fill the image with the shadow color that you said before. We also set the offset and other things. So we're going to apply all of that. And we got ourselves our shadow. And then it's going to go. Be, uh, it's going to be copied over to the original buffer, and we can now get rid of the off-screen buffer. So, uh, as expected, uh, remaining steps are very straightforward. We just go layer by layer and draw everything on top of what we had before. And with that, our render phase is complete. We've got ourselves uh, the view that we wanted, and let's revise what just happened because of the shadow, we had to incur this off-screen pass. And we would very much like to avoid that. And we're going to look at ways to uh, draw a shadow and still not incur this off-screen pass. So um, just, for, uh, just to imagine a real-life application, you may have many, many shadows on your screen. You also may have shadow on every single collection view uh, cell. Uh, and uh, you're going to incur as many off-screen passes as many shadows, right? So this is going to build up. So it can get really worse, uh, right? And we want to ensure that we can avoid as many render, pa uh, sorry, off-screen passes as possible. So let's look at some ways that we can use. And I'm sure you guys will agree, most popular way is to use a Bezier path. So what happens when you add a shadow path? Uh, you have short-circuited the very, uh, expensive step of iOS having to figure out the shape of your shadow. Uh, when you give it a sh like a proper shape, it's going to just go ahead and draw the shadow and not incur the off-screen pass. So uh, we've basically made our shadow more performant. And uh, if you look at the other values, everything else uh, stays the same. You just provide the shadow path and you're done. And uh, you would say to me, hey, it's like a rectangle. Like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you can draw uh, many complicated paths with Bezier paths because it supports curves, shadows, circles, everything under the sun. But there are, uh, there are limits to this approach. For example, this tree here. Nobody is going to uh, go for the pain <laughs> to define a Bezier path for that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm not going to be the one, definitely. So that's when I have the option to rasterize your layer. So when you do that, iOS is going to uh, take a snapshot of the layer and cache it. So you have this cached uh, layer. And whenever your shadow is run for the second time, it will use that cache. So no more off-screen pass, uh, except the first one, of course. 
And this, this uh, actually comes with a heavy set of limitations. So you've been warned. Um, this, uh, so main, uh, I think the main uh, drawback of this technique is that if you end up changing your shadow parameters, if you end up changing the shape even slightly, the shadow is going to be redrawn. So your rasterization is basically useless. In fact, you have consumed a lot of memory, and you haven't gotten any performance boost. Uh, that's going to cause more problems. Uh, so yeah, you should be careful about that, which is, of course, uh, another drawback, consumption of memory. Your memory footprint uh, of your application is going to increase if you use this technique a lot, especially if you're rasterizing too many layers, going to do more harm than good. So if you use this technique, you should be profiling your app with instruments and ensuring that you're getting your required performance boost out of it. Uh, next one is pretty simple, really. You just use an image view instead of a shadow, and uh, it, you just add it as a sub-view. It's a background. And to be honest, this technique is not as bad as it sounds, because rendering images is actually very uh, fast compared to drawing, right? Uh, for a GPU, rendering images is actually pretty fast. So if you use this technique, you can uh, avoid all the render passes there are. And to draw that image, you can also use code. Uh, you can use Sketch or Photoshop or whatever to draw it. But uh, actually, CG Context lets you draw with a drop shadow. So it's not that hard to create uh, like a shadow uh, with in code, shadow image in code. And then once you've got the image, you can just use it how many other times you want. It's actually going to avoid you many, many precious render passes. So yeah, it's a good technique. Again, comes with limitations. You're going to have a very complicated view hierarchy. Two views instead of one everywhere you go uh, can get a little messy. And you have more code, especially if you use CG context technique. Uh, you're going to have more code, more points of failure. And this also doesn't support fully changing sizes. Like, I changed the circle there. Didn't work. Uh, if I just scale the whole image, you can scale the shadow, and it still works. So this technique actually has some uh, advantages over the rasterization technique, because you can still make it work somehow, but also depends on your use case. And lastly, since we looked at these amazing optimizations, I would not say for you to go ahead and do them, because uh, you can justify the time spent on all these optimizations if you can't uh, if you don't have a strong reason to do it, and if you can't measure the results, right? You don't have a framework to measure the results, it doesn't make sense. So let's look at those frameworks. We, and how you can you know, uh, see how your render loop, uh, how your application is impacting the render loop. Um, first one, animation each instruments. Apparently, we're going to hear about this in another talk, as Martin said. So yay, uh, because I don't have much details on it. This is a very helpful tool. If you really, really want to get all the details, it's new. I believe it was introduced uh, a year ago in WWDC. And uh, using this instrument, you can actually see how long your render phase your commit phase, and everything else took. So if you have a lag, and you sort of are able to profile it, you can see, uh, OK, render phase took like x milliseconds, but it should have taken lesser, or it should have taken more, whatever. So yeah, this is a very, very detailed tool. So I would definitely recommend uh, that one. But it's got a bit of learning curve. So yeah. Another one is XC test matrix. We saw a fantastic example in the last talk, so can refer to that. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, if you uh, add a test, your test will tell you you've broken the performance, um, and then you can go ahead and fix that using the other tools. Uh, Xcode Organizer also provides really, really good um, matrix for like scrolling performance and stuff like that. And a uh, good thing about that is it will uh, tell you what kind of experience your real uh, users are getting. And Apple actually has standards for these things. So you can compare that metric to Apple standards and then sort of um, see if you are so, uh, giving an optimal performance. If not, again, you can fix the issues. And the last one, and my favorite one, is the view debugger. I'm sure many of you are using this uh, day-to-day -day basis, uh, debugging your view hierarchy, whatnot. 
but you can actually use view, uh, the view debugger to see the number of render passes that you have incurred. So here, I am debugging a view hierarchy of uh, my application. Really, really nice UI, you <laughs> see. So if you uh, look at uh, the right panel over there and zoom in, you can see uh, the number of off-screens made by this uh, particular layer tree, uh, layer. And uh, note that to see this information, I selected the layer, not the UI view. So you have to select the layer to see that uh, sort of uh, info. And uh, view debugger by default doesn't show any layers. Uh, view debugger, you have to select uh, the show layers option. It's really hidden, uh, very secretive. So yeah, good luck finding it. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so it's very helpful though. Uh, I love this, especially if I'm experimenting with like Bezier paths and you can actually see the number reducing. It's amazing. Um, so yeah, um, you can give it a try. And lastly, uh, as you may have guessed, shadows are not the only ones that incur render pass. Uh, I really wanted to talk about off-screen pass. So there you go, my hidden agenda. This talk is not about shadows. <laughs> it's about effects that render uh, in, uh, sorry, incur when, uh, the off-screen pass. And image effects like blur and vibrancy, same reason is also incurs in, uh, the pass for exact same reason. Masking is also pretty expensive as an operation. Like uh, if you mask a view, uh, your uh, off-screen buffer is going to copy the entire view to the off-screen buffer, then it is going to apply the mask and it's going to copy the bits inside the mask to your original buffer. So yeah, it's, it's pretty expensive, worse than shadows. So yeah, you should be very careful using it. And uh, if you are using uh, doing rounded corners via masking, also uh, in curse render pass. So whenever you can, you should use the corner radius and corner curve properties. And so next time you see uh, any like performance issues in your app, you can uh, look at any of these and uh, hopefully use the tools that we uh, looked at before to diagnose those issues. And that's it. Thank you for listening. <laughs>